الملك القدوس السلام المؤمن المهيمن العزيز الجبار المتكبر سبحان الله عما يشركون يسبح له ما في السماوات والأرض وهو العزيز الحكيم الله أكبر ولله الحمد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إذا زلزلت الأرض زلزالها وأخرجت الأرض أثقالها وقال الإنسان ما يومئذ تحد 
حدثوا أخبارك بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إذا زلزلت الأرض زلزالها وأخرجت الأرض أثقالها وقال يومئذ تحدث أخبارها بأن ربك أوحى لها يومئذ يصدر الناس أشتاتا ليروا أعمالهم فمن يعمل مثل قال ذرة خير يرى ومن يعمل مثقال ذرة شر فصل لربك وانحر إن شانئك هو الأبتر بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم فصل لربك وانحر إن شانئك هو الأبتر صدق الله العلي
بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم با عرض تعزیت و تسلیت به مقام رفیع و منیع ولایت بسم الله این این نام الله عزیز مرسی مرسی کمپشنت ای افر مای کندولنسیز تو آر ماستر Al Hujat bin Hassan, Imam Zaman, may Allah hasten his reappearance. On the occasion of the morning days, which is the greatest calamity in all human history. The month of Muharram al-Haram and the month of Safar uh, of the mornings. And also I offer my condolences to all the faithful throughout the world and all the oppressed throughout the world on the hope that Allah Almighty Hasten his his reappearance, inshallah, so that humanity and specifically the faithful uh, they will be saved from the, all the um, problems and difficulties that that li they live through. Imam Hussein Ali Salam, in terms of his virtue and station and ranks, he is in the fifth rank. He said, my grandfather is better than me, superior to me. My father is better than me. My mother is better than me. My brother is better than me. However, in the uh, creation, divine creation and the div divine rulings and in the uh, positive and negative aspects, Imam Hussein is the first in the creation in the history of creation. There is a <coughs> book called al khasais al Husseiniya. The specifics about Imam Hussein, the peculiars about Imam Hussein. From what I've seen, it, it may be one tenth of what is being recorded from, reported from the Imams in the ziyarat and so on. Every single word of it is a, is a specific to Imam Hussein, is a khasisa, it's a peculiar to Imam Hussein. It's a peculiarity of Imam Hussein. May Allah give success that the gentlemen, the scholars, especially, especially the youth, the faithful, and the faithful ladies, they gather from the riwayat, from the narrations, and, and the salutations, and the supplications, about the peculiarities and the specifics of concerning Imam Hussein. Maybe, it may even be ten, ten volumes of work. This is my understanding of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, has given Imam Hussein specific attributes 
and not only for Imam Hussein himself, but also for his sha'ar, for his uh, rites and rituals. It's something that he hasn't even uh, made uh, for the four ma'asum who are superior to him. There's, there's no doubt that given if he's got these peculiarities and the specifics, it doesn't mean that he's superior to the other four. But this is how Allah said it. So what, given all this, what should we do? So whatever we can do, whatever we can think of, we will, con we will always be fall short of fall short of what we what sh needs to be done. But <coughs> deliberate negligence about Imam Hussein. It doesn't mean that if someone does something against or negative against the Imam Hussein Ali. The Prophet says, Oh Allah, let down or Probably, Allahumma akhdul, probably in Farsi it means it's being indifferent. Not only let down. So, he, he can promote because of Imam Hussein, but he does less than what he, he can. He can. He can use his pen to write, but he can do less, he does less than that. This is called khidlan. It's like letting down. It's like, and it's got, it's got degrees, just like giving six, uh, support. Someone does to various degrees, but we should avoid doing any degree of letting down. I'll give some examples. I will read. Uh, uh, a brief of the uh, of some narrations. Uh, one narration said, Adam ala nabina wa alayhi wa alayhi wa salam. He used to pass through Karbala and he tripped in the locality of uh, where Imam Hussein would be killed, such that until blood started. Started, his feet started bleeding, and he asked his Lord, Adam asked his Lord. The, there are details, of course, of this, but I'm just making the point. And he he asked his Lord uh, about this. What happened that I tripped, and and there's so much blood coming out of my feet. Allah revealed to him in, in this land your son Hussein will be killed. So your blood is shed here out of sympathy and solidarity with Imam Hussein alayhi salam. So after so many years, here, Imam Hussein will be killed, your son. So I wanted, uh, I wanted that you have you show solidarity and sympathy with Imam Hussein by shedding your blood here. The Prophet was killed. Fatima Zahra was killed. Imam Imam Ali was killed. But we don't have something that in Medina something like this happened. In Najaf something like this happened. 
Adam was passing through Najaf when that happened, or Adam was passing through Medina. So even though the other four are superior to Imam Hussein, but this is one of the peculiar peculiarities of Imam Hussein. Another narration, uh, Nuh was passing, uh, and his, his ship was passing through Karbala. Look at the narrations that the Ark of Noah's Ark passed Mecca, Medina, Samarra, Mashhad. You can see that it has passed through various and also passed through Karbala. But, but when Nuh passed, when Noah's Ark passed through, when Noah's Ark was passing through Karbala, Nuh feared that he was, his, his, his ark was being drowned. It, it, he, it, was, it was taken by, by the land, by the earth. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, contrary to all the rules and regulations, and the Lord, he created a whirlpool and it pulled, it pulled the ark to the land, to the earth. So, whirlpool um, usually takes down a, a human being or something. But Noah's ark was the length of it was 1,200 dirah, yard. And the width of it is 800 dirah, or probably yard. There were thousands of boards, uh, which, uh, of, which, and the, the, the depth of the ark was 40 dirah, or 40 yards. These minarets of the shrines of the Ma'asumin, none of them is 40 dhara. It was like a, a, a quarter, or like a, a city. So what sort of whirlpool required that pulls the, this entire ark, this massive ark, to the earth, such that Noah was uh, fearful and scared that they're going to be drowned. Probably we never had such a whirlpool on the planet Earth. The holy city of Mecca is surrounded by mountains. The, the ark also passed Mecca. Whirlpool is where we have at the center there is a depression and around it there is height. So the Noah's Ark passed through Mecca, over Mecca, and there, there, was, there was certainly a whirlpool there, but nothing happened to Noah's Ark. The only thing that happened uh, only happened in Karbala. Whereas in Karbala, we don't have any mountain around Karbala. For hundreds of miles, the, there are absolutely no uh, there are no mountains, even up to Samarra and after Samarra. There are no mountains, which are hundreds of miles away. And this is an exception which only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will for this to occur on that occasion. And I'm not on a flat earth for, for a whirlpool to happen. <coughs> uh, and I don't know if something like this had happened elsewhere. Archangel Gabriel descended and said, O oh, Nuh, 
it is in this location that Al Hussein will be killed. <coughs> on, the, on the third occasion, uh, uh, Prophet Ibrahim, Prophet Ibrahim, passed through the land of Karbala, and he fell, and he broke his head, and he started bleeding. Profusely. He was walking on the plain land of Karbala and he, 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 he fell to the ground. In, in Karbala, we don't have uh, uh, rocks, we don't have rock, it's all sand or pebbles. So his head his head broke. He he broke his head. Isn't that an exception? When you fall on the on, on, on sand doesn't happen. But it happened in in the case of Ibrahim in Karbala. and started bleeding profusely from his head uh, and Jibrail came to him Archangel Jibra, uh, Gabriel came to him and said it is in this place that Al-Hussein will be killed so your blood, your blood is shed uh, profusely uh, in sympathy and out of solidarity with the blood of Imam Hussein in other words, it's narrated that Ismail uh, with his sheep, he had, he had his sheep and they were roaming by the Furat, by the Euphrates. So for many days, the sheep would not drink from the Euphrates. They become thirst. They become thirsty. But, um, but they, they didn't drink any water for many days. So he was passing through, but he. <coughs> so Archangel, Archangel Jibreel came down and said to him, Ismail asked uh, Archangel Jibreel, why, why they don't, they don't drink? So he said, you ask the sheep. So the sheep answered to him, that Imam Hussein will be killed here. So we're not going to drink, he will be killed here thirsty, so we're not going to be drinking from this water until we go somewhere else. Another narration. It's narrated that Musa was passing through Karbala. So he had a thorn entered his feet and he started bleeding profusely from his feet. So this is only thorn, thorns. It's not like uh, a sword or a blade. So we shouldn't we shouldn't expect blood bleeding. Uh, his feet start bleeding profusely, but this is what happened through thorns. So Allah revealed to him that here Al Hussein will be killed. 
So your, your, your blood is shed here uh, in solidarity with Imam Hussein alayhi salam, with, with the blood of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Also, there's a narration that Sulaiman, when his, when his basat, when his carpet was flying from Kar, uh, over Karbala, I've never seen uh, something like this had happened elsewhere. And the Suleiman's carpet it was huge and it was flying over Karbala. <coughs> so the wind <coughs> circulated, turned the, the wind, turned the carpet. Uh, of Sulaiman, three times around the land of Karbala, such that Sulaiman feared that he's going, to, he's going to um, drop to the to the ground. So, <coughs> the basat of Sulaiman was like a city. So he had jinn and ants, or the angels. And food and so on. It's worked like an entire city. It used to fly by the order of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This time, there was like a tornado. There was a whirlwind which, which was bringing the, the basad to the ground, but it, it landed gently. And they all were fearful that they're gonna drop and die. So S Solomon asked the wind, what has happened? So the wind said, here, Al Hussein will be killed. It's narrated that Isa uh, salam, with his disciples they passed through Karbala. As I said, these are detailed in Bihar and so on, but I'm only mentioning briefly. So they so they saw a lion. Uh, he signaled to them that they can't pass through here. And Isa asked him why. So the lion said, We're, we're not going to allow you to pass through here unless you curse the killers, the killer of Imam Hussein, who is Yazid. So they curse Yazid and he allowed them to pass through. For, for no Prophet no. Akan Jizabi, he brought five nails with a number of one in the name of the Prophet, and one in the name of Amir al Mu'mineen, another one in the name of Farm al Zara, and one in the name of Imam Hassan, and, and the fifth one in the name of Imam Hassan. This is to stabilize the ship. The fifth.
Hussein is just no one. The Hussein is just a human being. Hussein is Iman. Hussein is Taqwa. Hussein is Jihad. Hussein is bravery. Hussein is a way of life. In the tragic month of Muharram, one of the most significant acts is the provision of tabarruk and niyaz for Husseiniyas worldwide. In a world plagued by hunger and the merciless killing of Shia Muslims on a daily basis, it becomes our duty to give to those in need. Countless Husseiniyat, Imam Bargas and centers cook meals to nourish their local communities as the masses gather to remember Imam al Hussein And do you know what? The orphans and widows absolutely cherish it. During this time of year, hundreds of thousands of orphans, widows, and people living in poverty rely on niyaz and tabarruk. Just imagine the profound impact a single plate of food, a glass of water, or a bag of fruit can have. These simple items can nourish a hungry child, bring comfort to a struggling family, and even inspire a brighter future. However, we cannot do this alone. We need your help to create a lasting impact this Muharram. Join us in this collective effort to provide basic necessities that every human deserves. Make your niyaz count and donate your tabarruk now so that it can reach the Husseinis and the Zainabis of today. Over 1,300 years since the Battle of the Free, the effort of millions globally heightens during these sacred nights. The mark of the beginning of the Islamic calendar marks the beginning of the oppression against the Holy Prophet and his holy progeny. For the next 10 nights, commencing from the 19th of July, Muhibban al-Mahdi will begin their annual commemoration of the Holy Month of Muharram, aired live and exclusive on Imam Hussein TV3, with guest speaker. Sheikh Muhammad Abbas Panjou, English eulogy by Ammar al Nashi, Urdu eulogy by Muhammad Abbas Karim, and recitation of the Holy Quran by Mustafa al Ali. Join us as we count the days down and day by day get closer to the reappearance of our Savior, Imam al Mahdi. Ajalallahu ta'ala farjah al Shari.
Because it's amazing that many people think death will never come to them. If you speak to many out there, including myself, you always imagine that I've got 40 years left to live on this earth. The average age of those who die is normally 70, 80. I'm still in my 30s. Or you'll find someone thinking they're still in their 20s or in their teens. And therefore, many of us, however many deaths we witness, hardly think about death. Are we ready for death? If we were to face death in front of us and it was there calling us, would we be ready to leave the world now or no? The one area where the Muslim community lacks knowledge in terms of its meaning, in terms of its philosophy, in terms of its journey, is death. One reason is because of the fact that we're scared to talk about death. Even when a Mawlana chooses to talk about death, or an Imam talks about death, people in some cases become miserable straight away. But as the Ahlul Bayt said, when you talk about death, it's not for you to become miserable. Rather, it's for you to reflect Not uh, our normal settings for a film shoot, but I remember you done a series on death. How did that come out? Yeah, I felt the perspective that was normally given on death was very uh, negative, uh, in some cases scary. And I think we live at a time where belief in the unseen is, uh, is under question. This idea of uh, another realm, another dimension is already under question. And then on top of that, you want to include uh, punishment of grave. You want to include snakes coming and pressure cooker, you know, within the grave and then burning in hell. And uh, everybody goes to uh, hell except the Muslims and there is no salvation for other human beings. I felt that the whole perspective about not just death, but the afterlife was, uh, was a perspective that not only didn't necessarily correlate with the Qur'an and the ahadith of the Ahlul Bayt salam, but also was not helpful in this period. You know, I, I know people who stopped going to mosques because majalis were always about how if you don't miss your prayer, you're going to die and you're going to be punished and munkar and nakir and dua Abu Hamza thamali and, and uh, the whole image was extremely negative. But then you find people such as the Ahlul Bayt salam, who when they're coming towards death, Fustu, Warab al-Kaaba is an example, or Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam and his lines. Um, there's this really positive look like there is in, in many of their traditions. So I felt that there needed to be a series which really re-examined the narrative concerning death and the afterlife. And I, I hope that, what, that, you know, that was achieved. Yeah. When you were doing your research, was there any part during that period where you were researching where you thought, wow, this is actually scary? Do you know what? No. Uh, there was no part in the research that I've personally done on death and the hereafter where I looked at and I'm like, that's really scary. Rather, there are parts of maybe uh, wonder. <clears throat> There's parts of some guilt where you're thinking to yourself that how many more chances is God going to give me and how many more times does God remind us? Sorry. When you're looking at the number of verses in the Quran 
And that's, I think that's where, if you begin with why the Arabs hated the new message of Islam, it was because of the suwar that are named after aspects of, or the suwar that discuss death and the day of judgment. Haqqa, <clears throat> waqi'a, naba. Amongst other suwar in the Quran, they didn't mind if you talked about God. <clears throat> they had a belief in God. Maybe a belief which became idol worship, but they had a belief. <clears throat> and if you talked about prophets of God, they don't mind. They love Nabi Ibrahim alayhi salam. You know, they would talk regularly about hajj. But don't talk about death. And where the Quran hits them, <clears throat> and this can be seen in certain verses of the Quran where there's a back and forth. قَالَ مَنْ there's a, there's a back and forth that's taking place between the likes of Abu Jahl, Walid ibn al-Mughira, Utbah ibn Rabi'a, Umayyah ibn Khalaf. People like this, are, there's, there's a clear back and forth that's taking place between them and what the Prophet, peace be upon him, his family is preaching. So I got to say that when I was looking at at death, I was more thinking to myself that, you know what, Allah SWT, you've reminded me so many times and yet maybe I haven't necessarily taken on board these reminders. But fear? No. Excitement? Maybe. Is there going to be a chance that I could see Ahlul Bayt, salam? And if death is what's going to lead to that, that's a bridge I'm willing to cross. You mentioned that it's the unknown realm. Usually you are scared of something that you do not know. You know, if someone told you behind this door could be anything from something that's going to excite you, something that's going to scare you, just you not knowing what's behind that door, you might not be willing to open that door. But once you open that door or once you're told what's behind that door and if it's good, exciting, then you're going to be willing to open that door into that unknown that was unknown. Yeah. Let's look at the primary source when it comes to death, the Qur'an. Uh, before we look at, obviously, the Ahlul Bayt, because we have the Hadith of Thaqalain, the Qur'an and the Ahlul Bayt. When it comes to the Qur'an, and you mentioned uh, the Qur'an speaks about death, and there's a, quite a large proportion of the Qur'an that speaks about death. What does the Qur'an tell us about death and barzakh? Well, where do you begin, really? When you look at the Qur'an, there's a reminder that one day we're all going to go to a grave. I think there's not a human being on this earth who doesn't fear death at one stage of their life or another. I can't say that I feared it in the research that I was doing, but fear if you were telling me that throughout my life, mm. come on, we've all feared death. We fear the day we're going to die. And I think what the Quran tries to highlight to us is that you're fearing it because you're too attached to certain possessions that you don't know how you're going to separate from them. Family. Mm. Uh, personal belongings, status. Hence, the Quran begins by saying, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Al-Hakum, Al-Takathur. Al-Hakum, Hada ilahik. When you say Hada ilahik, that means this person is going to take you, you take you away from maybe that which you should be focusing on. Distracting Distraction. Al-Hakum, Al-Takathur. People were looking at the maqbara, this graveyard, this central place where, of course, in Islamic literature, this central place is meant to be a place which is in the, in the middle of the city, mm. not on the outskirts. Today, it's, the outskirts. it's a place which is in the outskirts. Why is it important to be in the middle? So on your way to work, you remember death. Allah. Uh, on your way to work, you have to remember death. You have to remember that today I could end up scamming someone. I could end up uh, destroying someone's life. I could be en ending up sacking someone cold. Um, and so when you see the maqbara, and hence you see in early Islam, Jannat al-Mu'alla or Jannat al is in central. <laughs> you go to Mecca, Mu'allat is right in the middle. And Baqi' is right next to Masjid al Nabawi. <clears throat> if you look here, this is Atraf. This isn't downtown. 
This isn't next to the Haram of Imam Al-Hussein alayhi salam or the Haram of Abel Fadl. We're in the outskirts. We're in the outskirts. Anyone on their way to work might pass this area. Wadi Salam is very down, down next to maybe the Harams. So in early Islamic literature, you'll find that the Maqbara was, was that. And the Quran is saying to the Arabs who are looking at the Maqbara and saying, I've got more graves than you. I have more family members than you. Al-Hakum al-Takathur. Hatta zurtum al-Maqabar. Kalla sawfa ta'lamun thumma kalla. Sawfa ta'lamun. Kalla law ta'lamun ilm al-yaqeen latarawunna al-jaheem thumma latarawunna ha'ayna al Yaqeen. These stages are spoken about where the certainty within the human being of the realities and the dimensions of life are all about to appear for them. So at the beginning, the Quran is talking about the grave because that's the thing we associate the most with death. It also says, if you claim to be the people of God, then seek death. You claim that you're a religious person, then you should be scared of death. You should just see it as another step in your journey. Those ayahs which talk about, you know, الَّذِينَ هَادُوا إِنْ زَعَمْتُمْ أَنَّكُمْ لِلَّهِ مِنْ دُونِ النَّاسِ فَتَمَنَّوا الْمَوْتِ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ وَلَا يَتَمَنَّوْنَهُ أَبَدًا There are certain people who claim, أَنَا متدين. I'm religious, I'm a Muslim, I'm a believer. The moment you mention death, Baba, stop talking about death, can we change the convo? Quran was also saying, test yourself, use death as a mirror. mirror. Are you ready to die today? And then these, these traditions come about which are telling us pray your prayers if it's the last prayer look at this world as if you're going to go at any second and we're introduced to Malik al Mot. and so when you're introduced to someone like Malik al Mot, you're seeing someone like Malik al Mot as a reality who could come to you at any second if he could come to Sulaiman while Sulaiman in the Quran is looking at his kingdom, kingdom. then Malik al Mot arrives and that's it a man like Sulaiman السلام, who has a kingdom which nobody else has, all of a sudden the angel of death. So the Quran, what it does, it either gives you the maqbara or the qabr, or it tells you about prophets and their relationship with the world of death or their enemies. Pharaoh begins to want to be religious when death comes upon. And the Quran is saying, Al -an, no. Al-an, it's telling all of us that look, this idea that I'll become religious if I find out I have a disease or a virus or I'm gonna die. No, you don't need to wait till then because there's no such thing as, for example, as I'm dying. Okay, al-an, for example, amen to Rabbi Musa wa Harun. La 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 la. Not when you're drowning. We gave you enough opportunities, and the Quran wants us to take advantage of these opportunities. And then the Quran wants to also remind us, whatever atom's way of good you did, we will show it. But also whatever atom's way of bad that you did, we'll show we will all show it. And it introduces you then to the day of judgment. It's telling you how you're going to be raised. It's telling you there's a balance of scales for your actions. It's telling you your intentions are going to be vital on that day. It also introduces you to the fact that don't worry too much. Intercession is going to be allowed for certain personalities on that day. So the Quran really takes you on a journey from looking at the Maqbara all the way until literally the divisions of heaven and hell. I think we're not the only ones. Look, Judaism and Christianity also have this journey which medieval Christian scholars would talk about, which different authors in that period would talk about you know what is the reality of death what's purgatory what happens to the soul so it's interesting that the abrahamic faiths all have their own conception and the quran is one of them during the last two years i'm sure you know of people that have lost their lives i'm sure during your career as a scholar you've attended uh, while people maybe are passing away while they're being buried, while Talqeen's done, all these stages. And no doubt they're difficult stages that some may go through. And if I remember correctly, you mentioning that sometimes the purification of the nafs takes place during maybe the squeezing of the grave, 
during maybe difficult times you go through as your soul's being taken, your experience with these circumstances as a scholar, what are the difficult stages of death from the time you're in that moment when you know these are your final moments and you may have your loved ones around you crying till the moment you're placed in a grave over here. Even having loved ones around you is a huge blessing. There was a funeral at my mosque, the Haider Islamic Center in South London. There was a funeral a few weeks ago. The man who died had no family there. They were even questioning, shall we cremate or is there something that you guys have to do with the body? But he did mention that he was a Muslim who loved Ahlul Bayt. So we thought we'll come to you guys. You probably know more about it than us. Even having family around you in those final moments, reciting the Holy Quran is a huge blessing. And I think also for some families, if you do see your parents in pain or your family members in pain, don't take it too badly. Rather be going through some sort of, you know, as you mentioned, purification process now than what the Quran describes Quranically with, uh, with hell, for example. Um, so those, the pangs of death are what I ask God, I think, all the time for him to allow me at that period that's known as Sakrat al Maut or the Sakarat, I, I ask God in that period where we are literally intoxicated, you know, don't know what's happening. I ask God to make sure that my faith is firm. The Quran and the traditions talk about that period being a, a difficult period. You could actually lose one's faith at that period, or you could be blessed to see a, a personality like the Prophet, peace be upon his family, come take you. And I think then after that, Islam is very particular about making sure that just because a body has now, you know, died, it doesn't mean that you don't treat it with respect. The mosques around the Muslim world do amazing work in the way they wash bodies. Um, and then after the washing of the body, you know, the funeral prayer, which as you said in the last couple of years, there's been an increase in number. And I look at these people, I'm thinking a week ago, I was having a conversation with them. A year ago, I was reciting a majlis at their house. And now I'm leading the funeral prayer for them. Um, and then taking, you know, that or leading that janazah, leading that prayer and taking the body towards the graveyard. Everything is done very delicately. There's a recognition that just because the soul is now at the helm doesn't mean the soul itself is going through an easy transition. Not only should one focus on being delicate with the body, but they should also recognize that, you know what, around that soul, even limiting one's gossip, even limiting one's talk, that person is in a state of shock. The soul is in a state of shock. Uh, and then from there, you know, the reciting of certain Quranic verses such as Surat al-Mulk, people recite Surat Yaseen. And certain recommended acts, you see the Talqeen, for example, being recited. All of these show that Islam wanted that transition to be as smooth as possible. What do you think from your reading, your research, benefits one during that period? In life, if you were to see someone and tell them, you follow these three steps and say, it, we're not talking about salah, we're not talking about hajj, the obligations. What benefits one other than obviously making sure you do these acts during those stages? What can one hold on to? I think what we could do for them is pay sadaqah. I think that's, that's the biggest thing you could do for someone who has died. Sadaqah has a huge effect and benefit to the one who has died as for us before we pass away i think you know our prayers and our respect for our parents i think those two go a long way 
you know, I think they come back to help us. Alongside the love of the family, you know, the Prophet and the Holy Household, you know, these, I would say, without a doubt, have an effect. Then the traditions begin to mention certain things that if they survive you, your bank account of reward continues, like having a righteous child or the spread of knowledge or a charity that, you can t that keeps on giving, you know, the gift that keeps on giving. These are all things which you'd see in the traditions. When you look at your own personal life, and you mentioned you've done a whole research and we spoke about your research on death. I'm sure you think about death a, a lot. How do you think about death with regards to yourself? Where does your mind go? That's a great question. Um, yeah, I do sometimes wonder that, you know, what happens? You know, where are we heading? How long do we remain asleep for? Barzakh sounds like this place where you sleep for a long time. You hope that you've represented yourself well because I think heaven and hell are when you're placed with people similar to you. People all focus on heaven. You know, they hear about rivers and they hear about gardens and in hell they hear about, you know, hot boiling water and skin changes. I think the first thing I reflect is what, what have I become? And that's going to be the type of people I'm going to be with in the hereafter. Then you reflect on the separation from one's family. That's difficult. And you hope that your family for the longest time you survive them, they don't survive you because you don't, you know, you don't want them to be in pain after you've gone. And the third thing I think is I just hope that although it can never be done, but you hope you've given God something of a sign of gratefulness in terms of what God gave to us. Yeah. May Allah prolong the life of your loved ones. Yeah. Has a death affected you? Do you remember of a death even maybe many years ago or till recently? Has any death of anyone close to you affected you? And if so, how did the death of anyone affect you? I think it's a great question because I think that sometimes in life we all need one trial to really wake us up, to really even understand events like Karbala, you know. Um, but there have been a couple of deaths of um, either, you know, family or friends where it was, you know, it hurts. It hurts um, seeing someone in your community younger than you suddenly die who you may have spoken to a couple of weeks earlier and who was a good soul, but went too young. You know, that breaks one's heart. Or seeing someone who is a friend of yours lose someone they love and, you know, breaking down because you see them break down. Um, and I do wonder about a day, you know, when you lose your own beloved ones, how will you react? And that's why you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for patience in that period. It may be easier for someone like you, maybe, because you read into the life of the Ahlul Bayt and what they went through. Mm. You know, sitting in a graveyard, just remembering that some of the Imams, like Imam As-Sajjad, had to bury his father. Not only does he have to bury his father, he has to bury his brothers, his uncles his brother's companions, some of his own companions, and he's not doing it to a body that's in a state mm. to actually be. So for you, maybe it's when you read into those, it gives you patience uh, more than maybe others. And again, that's why the unknown is confusing, but once you know something, it makes it easier. How, again, may Allah bless you, Sayyid, how, how would you like to be remembered. I would say that Amma, do you think? No, I think I, I, I've never wanted to make it about said Ammar. You know what I mean? I, you mentioned the names that it should be about. And that's why I've always said to myself that if, if a loved one of mine died, I can see myself crying more 
for what Imam Zain Abdi السلام, went through with Imam Al Hussein more than even my loved one. Mm. Ultimately, may my mom and my dad be sacrificed for them. That's what we say in Ziyara. Yeah, and I, I think that's something we need to reflect on. If my father and my mother sac- uh, pass away and I can cry for them more than I can cry for Ahlul Bayt, I have to reassess myself. Um, or if I can cry for them and then remember that, hold on, mom and dad passed away, but they'll never face what Imam Al Hussein السلام, faced. And for that matter, all of Ahlul Bayt having really difficult deaths and having very difficult burials. I don't want it to be about me, in all honesty. I really, I really don't want it to, you know, go in that direction. I'd love it if, for example, people, you know, read the Quran or remember you with a Fatha or remember you with Majalis. Some, that, would be, that would be something amazing uh, from well wishes. But I'd always want it to be a case of, you know what, direct that all towards the martyrs of the 10th of Muharram. Speaking of the martyrs of Muharram, the martyrs of Ashura, the service of Aba Abdullah is something that's in your DNA, something that's part of you. We've been here on Ziyara and I've heard by being with you, seeing so many people come to you and say, you've changed my life. How much will that service and we're in Karbala for Aba Abdullah will benefit you once you're ready to face. Yeah, you know, I hope that, inshallah, that service has a clean intention. I, that's the thing I reassess the most. What's my intention behind serving? You know, what's your intention behind serving food in Muharram? What's your intention behind, for example, beating your chest? What's your intention behind going to a majlis? What's your intention behind giving a majlis? I always have to reassess my intention. I really sincerely hope that my intention is not tainted is not, um, you know, affected by impure thoughts. Um, and that service to Abu Abdullah is ultimate aim is to get me closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The ultimate aim has to be getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let's not forget that ultimate aim. I hope that in serving Imam Hussein, I don't compartmentalize my religiosity with, okay, I've served Imam Hussein, that means that I've done enough for the year. No, is this service gaining me closeness to God? Is my akhlaq the akhlaq of the Lord? The akhlaq that the Lord wanted established? There are some who serve Imam Hussein and they stop there. Hence, some servants of Imam Hussein salam, don't pray. They will cause absolute havoc in Muharram. Don't pray. That service, I have to continuously remind myself, the ultimate aim of it, it's a means, not an end. In Karbala, the man buried here wanted us to be like him. Ashhadu annaka qad aqamta salat Wa atayta zakat Wa atayta zakat Wa amarta bil ma'roof Wa nahayta anil munkar Wa ata'ta Allah This fundamental Hatta atakal Yaqeen Yaqeen Al yaqeen here doesn't mean certainty It means mort Death Death I want to make sure And I hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Inspires me to continue My service for Imam al Hussein As a continuing of a divine journey Not of Iraqi culture or indo pak culture, or Khoja culture, or Lebanese culture. No, no, no. Or Shi'i culture. Rather, it is a form of a journey which is transformative. Insha'Allah, that is where I will continue to head. Today, I have with me the holy flag from the holy shrine of Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam as a gift for you, Sayyid. Thank you so much. No one deserves this more. God bless. Thank you. The servant of Imam Hussein. Am I Hussain. getting to keep this, or of is this course. just for the camera? No, inshallah, it's Thank for you, Sayyid. God bless. This is for your service for Abu Abdullah Al Hussein. But I have a final question before I leave you, and that, inshallah, as you mentioned, when we're in that you. moment when we are maybe told that we will be facing death, we are told maybe the Ahlul Bayt will appear. 
someone who served Abu Abdullah al Hussein, I'm sure Imam al Hussein alayhi salam will be there for them. Inshallah, Ram. My question is for you, Sayyid. What will be the first thing you say to Abu Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam when you see him? You know, you, you think about these things, and uh, I don't even know if you'll have the strength to even talk because I think the first thing you'll break down. If we break down and we haven't even met Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, and we break down just by listening to what happened to him. Imagine that you get the chance to meet Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. I suppose maybe the first thing would be thank you. you know, thank you for what you did on the 10th of Muharram. Because if it wasn't for that, as the ziyara says, we would be still in the depths of Jahiliyyah. Thank you. Yeah. Sayyid Amma, thank you for joining us. God bless. Thank you. Abdullah al Hussein, salawatullah wa salamu alayhi wa 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 al
he fell to the ground and the eclipse was complete. Once a silvery moon now stained by blood. I wept and wept to see Zainab weeping every night. Because every time she looked at me, she would cry out, You are nothing compared to Abbas. In every corner of the earth, one moon reigns supreme. But in Karbala, there are two. Alas, how I wish I could abdicate and surrender myself before the worthier moon, buried under its dust. Join us for verses of love. The Husseini Kids Edition during the first 10 nights of Muharram. Only on Imam Hussein TV. To cry and well, stay. You leave her to cry and well, my son.
Rosatum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh dear viewers of Imam al-Hussein TV channel now you can see an amazing view of the holy shrine of Imam al-Hussein salawatullahi alayhi and from this holy land Karbala I want to announce that we've just devised one great initiative for all of our dear viewers this holy flag that you can see next to me is the holy flag of Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam and you can see all these names that have been written on it since it is the beginning of the new month as a sign and token of our gratitude and appreciation for all of our dear viewers who will help us for, to cover our monthly bills and expenses here in Imam al Hussein Media Group. We will write their names, we will add their names and the names of their dear ones and marhumin on the holy flag of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. WhatsApp us on the numbers below to find out how to support Imam al Hussein Media Group and also to send the names of your dear ones and marhumin to be added on the holy flag of Imam al Hussein salawatullah alayhi. In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, respected viewers, brothers and sisters in Islam, may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon you. Throughout history, many women are revered and remembered. These women are typically remembered for their bravery, courage, and even modesty. It is these women who have revolutionized our minds and have certainly given women a lot of worth. In the West, the common picture of a Muslim woman is a stereotype of a woman hidden behind a veil, a voiceless, silent figure 
bereft of rights. It is a picture familiar to all of us, in large part because this is invariably how the Western media portrays women in Islam. Islam covers many lands with many diverse cultures, from the borders of Arabia to the coast of Africa, from Bosnia to Indonesia. Large groups of people practice Islam. Islam is growing in European and American countries. Each one of these Islamic nations has its own distinct culture. There is a great diversity of cultures within Islam. One cannot bring all of these cultures, political systems, national heritage, belief systems, geographical locations, historical backgrounds, and all the peoples who embody them under one uniform category or think of them as one system. Islam is practiced in each nation according to those nations' characteristics, and nations are, by existing as nations, distinct and different from one another. No two cultures are alike. Muslim women have faced an unprecedented amount of discrimination, violence, and abuse. Women who stand out and stand up for what is right are unfortunately more prone to these outcomes. Today in our show, Powerful Women in Islam, we will be discussing the life of Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam. Amongst the 14 infallibles, it is necessary for one of them to be a woman as if all of them were men. Then all of the advice, recommendations, and teachings which we see directed towards the women of the community Things such as how to take care of one's spouse, how to maintain the home, and how to take care of the children, the style and function of the hijab, how to modestly maneuver within society, patience and submission to God in the face of challenges, and the hundreds of other teachings would have been more mere words which were spoken and simple theological discussion to be studied. It is possible that women of all ages would have said to themselves, if there was at least one infallible woman from amongst all of these people that God sent for guidance, a woman who knew what we as women go through, how we feel, and how our emotions are formulated, then all of these pieces of advice we have been given and responsibilities which have been put on our shoulders would not have been there, as these men just don't understand us. Therefore, the presence of Fatima al-Zahra salam as one of the 14 infallibles and her being a role model for women cemented the guidance and teachings which Islam brought and showed us that they are possible to implement in our daily lives. It is not only Fatima al-Zahra, peace be upon her, who showed this reality to the women, but also people like her beloved daughter Zainab, peace be upon her, who also becomes the ideal role model and is a grand historical figure for women to follow. Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra is the daughter of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and Sayyidah Khadija, the daughter of Khuwailid. May the Almighty be pleased with her. Sayyidah Fatima was born in Mecca on a Friday, the 20th of Jamaat al-Thani, in the fifth year after the declaration of the prophetic message, which corresponds according to the Christian calendar to the year 615. A number of chronicles quote her mother Khadija, narrating the following about the birth of her revered daughter. At the time of Fatima's birth, I sent for my neighboring Qurayshiyat women to assist me. They flatly refused, saying that I had betrayed them by marrying and supporting Muhammad. I was perturbed for a while when, to my great surprise, I saw four strange tall women with halos around their faces approaching me. Finding me dismayed, one of them addressed me this, O oh Khadija, I am Sarah, mother of Ishaq. The other three are Mary, mother of Christ, Asiya, daughter of Muzahim, and Umm Kalthum, sister of Moses. We have all been commended by God to put our nursing knowledge to your disposal. Saying this, all of them sat around me and rendered the services of midwifery till my daughter Fatima was born. The motherly blessings and affection received by Fatima السلام, were only for five years after which Khadija left for her heavenly home. The Holy Prophet brought her up thereafter. The Holy Prophet said, whoever injures bodily or otherwise, Fatima, he injures me. And whoever injures me, injures Allah. And whoever injures Allah, practices unbelief. O oh, Fatima, if your wrath is uncured, it incures the wrath of Allah. And if you are pleased, it makes Allah pleased too. The Prophet wasallam taught Fatima السلام, divine knowledge and endowed her with special intellectual brilliance, so much so that she realized the true meaning of faith piety and the reality of Islam. But Fatima السلام, also was a witness to Sarah. But Fatima السلام, was also a witness to sorrow and a life of anguish from the very beginning of her life. 
She constantly saw how her revered father was mistreated by the unbelievers and later how she herself follows a victim to the same abuse, only this time by some Muslims. Sayyidah Zahra السلام, is not just a role model for Muslim women or Muslim men. She is a role model for humanity as a whole. Regardless of what angle we want to view this, Sayyidah Zahra السلام, was a role model from any angle we looked at it. In the Quran, we read the recommended in the Quran, we read the commandment on being good to one's parents. Fatima the Zahra, peace be upon her, was so loyal and devoted to her father, the Messenger of God, peace be upon him and his family, that he said the following about her. You are the mother of your father. One meaning of this is that the love which she had for her father was so much greater than just the average love which a daughter would have for a father. Your Lord has decreed that you shall not worship anyone except him and he has enjoyed kindness to your parents. Should they reach old age at your side, one of them or both do not say to them, fee, and do not chide them, but speak to them noble words. She السلام, was known for her immense generosity. In the Quran we read the commandment on being generous and mu in the Quran we read the commandment on being generous and munificent munificent. In the Quran, we read the commandment on being generous and munificent. On the night of her wedding, when Fatima al Zahra, peace be upon her, was making her way to her husband's home, she was wearing a new wedding dress. Historical accounts narrate that a poor woman approached her or came to the door of the house she was in and asked for clothing to cover herself with. Rather than giving her the old dress which she had, she actually gave away her brand new wedding dress and wore her old clothes on her wedding night. You will never attain piety until you spend out of what you hold dear and whatever you may spend of anything. God indeed knows it. Not only that, Sayyidah Zahra السلام, was actually one of the ones who migrated for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the Quran, we read passages in regards to migration in the way of Allah. And as we know, Fatima al Zahra, peace be upon her, made the migration from Mecca to Medina along with the early group of Muslims. Those who have believed, migrated, and struggled in the way of Allah, and those who gave them shelter and help, it is they who are truly the faithful. For them is forgiveness and a noble provision. In the Quran, we read numerous verses about the patience, sincerity, complete submission to God, consciousness of God, and modesty, and indeed Fatima al Zahra, peace be upon her, has reached to the pinnacles of perfection in all of these areas. Indeed, the Muslim men and the Muslim women, the faithful men and the faithful women, the obedient men and the obedient women, the truthful men and the truthful women, the patient men and the patient women, the humble men and the humble women, the charitable men and the charitable women, the men who fast and the women who fast, the men who guard their private parts and the women who guard, the men who remember God greatly and the women who remember God greatly, God holds in store for them forgiveness and a great reward. Sayyidah Zahra has gained Sayyidah Zahra had gained a great amount of knowledge and wisdom from her father. In the Quran, we are advised to gain knowledge and to acquire the tools necessary to be granted wisdom, hikmah. And indeed, this regards Fatima Zahra, peace be upon her, shown bright as she has a book known as the Mushaf of Fatima, which the infallible Imams would sometimes refer to when they wanted to acquire information on events which would take place in the future. In the Holy Quran, we read. Read in the name of your Lord, who created, created man from a clinging mass. Read, and your Lord is the most generous, who taught by the pen, taught man what he did not know. From the life of Sayyidah Zahra, peace be upon her, we learn to be determined and not allow anything to stand in our way. We learn that life is not easy and that we have to be patient and be thankful with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has planned for us. In the Quran, we are spoken to in regards to working striving and struggling and when we glance at the life of Fatima al Zahra we see that on many occasions her hands were claws and bleeding from the amount of work which she used to perform and that nothing belongs to a person except what he strives for and that he will soon be shown his endeavor. In her dictionary السلام, arrogance and cruelty was not present. In the Quran there are verses in regards to showing justice in all aspects of life and when we study how Fatima al Zahra dealt with her housemaid, Fudla, and how she divided the daily tasks of the house, we see how she enacted justice in her life. Indeed, God enjoys justice and kindness and generosity towards relatives, and He forbids indecency, wrong, and aggression.
He advises you so that you may take admonition. In the Quran, we are addressed in regards to having faith in the next world and that we should yearn for the next life. And indeed, Fatima al-Zahra, peace be upon her, heard from her father that she would be the first person from this nation to leave this world and join him in the next life. While the hereafter is better and more lasting, by studying and understanding these few examples from the life of this illustrious woman, we are fully appreciate that Fatima al-Zahra, peace be upon her, is a practical and real-world example of the verses of the Noble Quran. Despite the fact that amongst almost all civilizations of yesterday and today, and within the poems, stories, and examples which are often recounted, women have almost always borne and brunt end of the stick and have constantly been humiliated and denigrated and have always been considered as a thing which must be associated to someone else in order to gain some identity. And that woman has always been looked upon as being the weaker gender. The Qur'an has shown us that not only for all women, but rather for all men as well. Thank you very much for tuning in, and we hope to see you in the next episode. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إنا أنزلناه في ليلة وما أدراك ما ليلة القدر ليلة القدر خير من ألف شهر تنزل الملائكة والروح فيها تنزل الملائكة والروح فيها سلام هي حتى مطلع الفجر إنا أنزلناه في ليلة وما أدراك ما ليلة القدر ليلة القدر خير من ألف شهر ليلة القدر خير من ألف شهر تنزل الملائكة والروح فيها تنزل
تنزل الملائكة والروح فيها بإذن ربهم من كل أمر سلام هي حتى مطلع الفجر صدق الله العلي العظيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم كل وليك الحجة به حسان صلواتك عليه وعلى أبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة Salat al-Maghrib is one of the five daily obligatory prayers and it consists of three rak'ahs. After performing wudu, go to your prayer mat and face towards the Kaaba. Now perform the niyyah and raise your hands above your shoulders and say Allahu Akbar Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضال بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل هو الله أحد الله الصمد لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفوا أحد الله أكبر Now bow down until the hands can be placed on the knees. سبحان ربي العظيم وبحمده. Then resume the standing position and go into prostration. سبحان ربي الأعلى وبحمده. Now raise the forehead and sit up in a kneeling position. Go again into a sujood position. سبحان ربي الأعلى وبحمده. Now sit up for a moment and then rise. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. الحمد لله رب العالمين. الرحمن الرحيم. 
مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل هو الله أحد الله الصمد لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفوا أحد Raise both your hands turning the palms facing upwards into a qunud position اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار بحق محمد وآله الأطهار Go into a ركوع position سبحان ربي العظيم وبحمده Then resume the standing position and go into prostration سبحان ربي الأعلى وبحمده Now raise the forehead and sit up in a kneeling position. Go again into a sujood position. سبحان ربي الأعلى وبحمده Now sit up and stay at this position. الحمد لله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد Now sit up for a moment and then rise سبحان الله والحمد لله ولا إله إلا الله والله أكبر سبحان الله والحمد لله ولا إله إلا الله والله أكبر سبحان الله والحمد لله ولا إله إلا الله والله أكبر Go into a ركوع position سبحان ربي العظيم وبحمده Then resume the standing position and go into prostration سبحان ربي الأعلى وبحمده Now raise the forehead and sit up in a kneeling position. Go again into a sujood position. سبحان ربي الأعلى وبحمده Now sit up and stay at this position. الحمد لله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد السلام عليك أيها النبي ورحمة الله وبركاته السلام علينا وعلى عباد الله الصالحين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الله أكبر الله أكبر Allahu Akbar Salat al-Isha is one of the five daily obligatory prayers and it consists of four rak'ahs. After performing wudu, go to your prayer mat and face towards the Kaaba. Now perform the niyyah and raise your hands above your shoulders and say Allahu Akbar Bismillahirrahmanirrahim الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين 
إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل هو الله أحد الله الصمد لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفوا أحد الله أكبر Now bow down until the hands can be placed on the knees سبحان ربي العظيم وبحمده then resume the standing position and go into prostration. Subhana Rabbi al-A'la wa bihamdi. Now raise the forehead and sit up in a kneeling position. Go again into a sujood position. Subhana Rabbi al-A'la wa bihamdi. Now sit up for a moment and then rise. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل هو الله أحد الله الصمد لم يلد ولم يولد وَلَمْ يَكُلْ لَهُ كُفُوًا أَحَدٍ Raise both your hands, turning the palms facing upwards into a qunud position. اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار بحق محمد وآله الأطهار Go into a ركوع position سبحان ربي العظيم وبحمده Then resume the standing position and go into prostration سبحان ربي الأعلى وبحمده Now raise the forehead and sit up in a kneeling position Go again into a sujood position. Subhana Rabbi al-A'la wa bihamdi. Now sit up and stay at this position. Alhamdulillah. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa Allah wahdahu la sharika lah. Wa ashhadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluh. اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد. Now sit up for a moment and then rise. سبحان الله والحمد لله ولا إله إلا الله والله أكبر. سبحان الله والحمد لله ولا إله إلا الله والله أكبر سبحان الله والحمد لله ولا إله إلا الله والله أكبر الله أكبر Now bow down until the hands can be placed on the knees سبحان ربي العظيم وبحمده then resume the standing position and go into prostration. سبحان ربي الأعلى وبحمده. Now raise the forehead and sit up in a kneeling position. Go again into a sujood position. 
سبحان ربي الأعلى وبحمده. Now sit up for a moment and then rise. سبحان الله والحمد لله ولا إله إلا الله والله أكبر. سبحان الله والحمد لله ولا إله إلا الله والله أكبر سبحان الله والحمد لله ولا إله إلا الله والله أكبر Go into a ركوع position سبحان ربي العظيم وبحمده Then resume the standing position and go into prostration سبحان ربي الأعلى وبحمده. Now raise the forehead and sit up in a kneeling position. Go again into a sujood position. سبحان ربي الأعلى وبحمده. Now sit up and stay at this position. الحمد لله. أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد السلام عليك أيها النبي ورحمة الله وبركاته السلام علينا وعلى عباد الله الصالحين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الله أكبر الله أكبر Allahu Akbar Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Dear viewers of Imam Al Hussein TV channel Now you can see an amazing view of the holy shrine of Imam Al Hussein Salawatullahi alayhi And from this holy land Karbala I want to announce that we've just devised one great initiative for all of our dear viewers This holy flag that you can see next to me is the holy flag of Imam Al Hussein alayhi salam And you can see all these names that have been written on it since it is the beginning of the new month, as a sign and token of our gratitude and appreciation for all of our dear viewers who will help us for, to cover our monthly bills and expenses here in Imam al Hussein Media Group, we will write their names, we will add their names and the names of their dear ones and marhumin on the holy flag of Imam al Hussein. WhatsApp us on the numbers below to find out how to support Imam al Hussein Media Group and also to send the names of your dear ones and marhumin to be added on the holy flag of Imam al Hussein.
In the tragic month of Muharram, one of the most significant acts is the provision of tabarruk and niyaz for Husseiniyas worldwide. In a world plagued by hunger and the merciless killing of Shia Muslims on a daily basis, it becomes our duty to give to those in need. Countless Husseiniyat, Imam Bargas and centers cook meals to nourish their local communities as the masses gather to remember Imam al Hussein. And do you know what? The orphans and widows absolutely cherish it. During this time of year, hundreds of thousands of orphans, widows, and people living in poverty rely on niyaz and tabarruk. Just imagine the profound impact a single plate of food, a glass of water, or a bag of fruit can have. These simple items can nourish a hungry child, bring comfort to a struggling family, and even inspire a brighter future. However, we cannot do this alone. We need your help to create a lasting impact this Muharram. Join us in this collective effort to provide basic necessities that every human deserves. Make your niyaz count and donate your tabarruk now so that it can reach the Husseinis and the Zainabis of today.
I come out at night to guide your steps. I listen to the lonely who share their secrets with me. I am the object of fascination, the cause of many a sleepless night of serenading poetry in my praises. I play hide and seek with you, sometimes hiding behind a cloud-like veil, sometimes reigning like the matriarch of the skies. I master the oceans, making them rough then tranquil. My sirens call to them just as apparent in mankind. Maybe that is why when people fall in love, they sometimes call that person after me. Even I have admired such beauty. The most beautiful person I ever gazed upon was a man called Abbas. The one who introduced himself on the battlefield as the moon of the house of Hashim. At first, a hint of jealousy arose in me to see him fairer than myself. But I kept looking and found my jealousy was in vain. For never was there a kinder brother, a devoted protector and chivalrous victor than Abbas. If I had been there at the river, I would have begged him to drink. No one would have blamed you, O oh Abbas. But he threw the water back, preferring the children of Hussein over himself. They shot an arrow towards the moon. How careless they were! What did they think they could achieve? With no arms, but still holding the skin of the flask by his teeth. He fell to the ground, and the eclipse was complete. Once a silvery moon now stained by blood. I wept and wept to see Zainab weeping every night. Because every time she looked at me, she would cry out, You are nothing compared to Abbas. In every corner of the earth, one moon reigns supreme. But in Karbala, there are two. Alas, how I wish I could abdicate and surrender myself before the worthier moon buried under its dust. بسم الله والحمد لله ولا إله إلا الله والله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد الرسول الله أشهد أن محمد الرسول أشهد أن علي ولي الله أشهد أن عليا حجة الله صلاة حي على الصلاة حي 
على الفلاح حي على الفلاح حي على خير العمل حي الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله لا صلى الله على سيدنا محمد وآله وسلم Welcome to the World and Imam Hussein Show. In this episode, we will be interviewing Dr. Said Inayatullah Andrabi, who is a Sunni Muslim author and former university professor and lecturer. We want to find out what he thinks and knows of the story and legacy of Imam Hussein, peace be upon him. Dr. Andrabi was born in Kashmir, which is currently occupied by India. He grew up in a mainly Sunni area. But he says there were a significant number of Shia Muslims in Kashmir who commemorated the tragedy of Karbala during Ashura and Muharram. Um, when was it in your lifetime when you first heard about Imam Hussein and the tragedy of Karbala? Do you remember when the first time that was? I mean, it's irrelevant to the extent that uh, uh, Imam Hussein lies at the very heart of Islamic consciousness. Uh, anybody born anywhere, uh, when when we come to the when we come to senses, when we come to uh, adulthood, when when we uh, when we start understanding the world around us, uh, Imam Sahin is very much there. It's one of the first things which one learns about uh, because. Uh, because uh, uh, what happened in Karbala has been kept alive by the processions of Muharram. Now, uh, I remember a small child when we used to see the uh, processions of Muharram and um, uh, uh, all that goes on with this. So, you saw uh, this in Kashmir? Yes, yes, in Kashmir, yes. yes. When you were a small child? Yes, a small child, because I, I was... Uh, uh, I mean, by 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 chance, we uh, we were living in in a location where there were uh, so many mourners of uh, uh, Imam Hussain, where there were so many Shia Muslims. But if I was not, even then, it was so prominent uh, the Muharram and the processions of the Muharram. It's so prominent that nobody would miss it. Nobody would say that I had not seen it. So my, my earliest memories are that of a child and watching the, uh, the, the procession of the Muharram and that had, um, that had uh, the impressions which, uh, which are life, uh, life-lasting impressions. Uh, what else did your community do uh, when it came to Ashura and Muharram and remembering Imam Hussein? Tell us some of the stuff that they used to do. Uh, people u- used to cutting across again the Shia Sunni, uh, people used to hold uh, dinners and invite people and 
uh, give them free food in the name of Imam Sahib, uh, invite them for a big dinner uh, and serve them very good food uh, only in the name of Imam Sahib because these are the days. So it, it was, uh, it used to be uh, so many functions held, so many uh, such invitations held. So it, it's uh, um, the, the month of Muharram throughout, uh, after the 10th also, uh, is full of the interaction, people inviting each other, eating at each other's places. So and Asia. Yeah, yeah. And I, I remember myself uh, in, in university uh, and in the student community, we used to uh, hold uh, special uh, programs commemorating the martyrdom and uh, talking about what martyrdom is, talking about what the what Imam San has done and what uh, was the relevance of that to Islam and educating people on that. And uh, it was uh, uh, not me only, but other uh, such organizations, such Islamic, Islamic political organizations, they used to hold uh, special programs, gatherings, where scholars come and they deliver uh, learned lectures about it and all this. So Muharram is uh, really a month of full activity on all the levels, intellectual level, social level, people interacting with each other and uh, people learning about it. So all these activities are uh, found in Muharram. And I have seen this, uh, I remember, I mean, I, I agree with this. So when you first heard about the story of Karbala and Imam Hussain um, and you read more about it, what struck you the most during the tragedy of Karbala? When I started, uh, when I started uh, working on my faith and when I started understanding my faith, uh, I, I could later understand the uh, more fundamental and subtle aspects of the whole uh, uh, of this whole uh, episode, of the whole uh, uh, what happened uh, at Karbala. But uh, in the beginning, it's always an emotional sort of thing. So, and what, what strikes everyone most was that uh, they were killed in Karbala, children, women and men, and in a state of thirst, water was blocked on them. That's why you see in Muharram, as, I, as we were discussing, as I was talking earlier, uh, you will see in, uh, in the Julus, in the, in the procession of the um, uh, Muharram, you will see at, at so many places people deliberately keep water. Water is served because it was the day when water was denied to the uh, uh, Holy Imam. So it was uh, that that was the thing which uh, which was uh, which was most striking, I think, to most of the people, not not only to me. How much of an impact did the story of Imam Hussein have on you, uh, you know, personally, and also uh, other members of your own family? Uh, tell us some of the inspiration that you received from his uh, legacy. Uh, uh, I can tell you from uh, on my part or my children, my wife, my family, uh, this is, uh, uh, Imam Hussain represents the sort of ultimate in Islam. I mean, one cannot go when it comes to the sacrifice and when it comes to standing up for Islam, one cannot go beyond that. It represents a sort of the ultimate and the, the more I have thought about it and I have uh, uh, I have written some uh, brief uh, pieces about it which are on the internet uh, it has it has become uh, clear to me that uh, if uh, if Imam San had not come to Karbala if he had not done what he did uh, things would have been, uh, I mean, uh, nobody knows what things have, Islam would have been something, uh, uh, it would have not been what, what it is. If, uh, be, because Islam has to be, uh, Islam has to uh, remain 
you know, you know the crux of Islam. Islam has to remain the revelation of God, which started with the first man, the Adam. It continued. God sent prophets, and it finished with the prophethood of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And this is the crux of Islam, and this this has remained so far. I believe only by what Hazrat Imam Sahib did. If he had not done, maybe Islam would have become some sort of uh, an Arab imperial uh, legacy, say uh, a, a, a religion as we see religions coming from China or uh, uh, like those uh, um, uh, uh, geography related uh, uh, traditions or religions. Islam might have been understood by this time. Maybe we would have been understanding it as something coming from Arabs, the kings, the great empires. It, it could have been exactly like that if Imam Sahib had not intervened, because he he intervened and his intervention was deliberate and properly thought through. He had thought through and. Being an imam, he had an inspiration from God. He had a sort of uh, he 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 not only thought by his mind. He he had an inspiration uh, because of which he did what he did. He he came to Karbala and stood up. If you if you go to the very depth of Karbala, if you go to the very depth of why Imam Sain decided to take such a step. Why he came with all his family, and why he put all his family in the, in Karbala? If you if you go to the very depths of it, you can you can find out that this was the line. The line was between Islam and Arab nationalism. Imam Hussain had to assert the principle. He he said that I have come to reform the Deen of my grandfather. This this was his this was his. He declared in one of his khutbas, which he delivered at Karbala, he he said, "I have come for this. I have come to reform. Reform means that something wrong had happened. Now the wrong direction was precisely this. It was going in the direction of Arab supremacy, Arab nationalism, which was not what Prophet had come for. Prophet had come to deliver a divine agenda for the humans, because Islam is for the humans. It is a It's an agenda for human welfare. Now, Islam is basically an agenda to help people in this world and make them successful for the life hereafter. It has to do nothing with the races and Arabs or non-Arabs, but something had happened, as you see, the 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 kingdom of Mawia. Mawia himself said that he is the first king of Islam. It is it's his words, nobody else's. He himself said. His kingdom was on the on the pattern of the Roman Empire. He was making it, uh, he was making it all the glorious and magnificent to match the uh, Roman uh, Empire. Now, th this was the problem. I I Islam was getting gradually; it would have gone, it would have become a sort of uh, um, a matter of Arab pride, but. Imam Sands, what he did in Karbala, he drew a fine distinction between the Islam and Arab nationalism, and th that that lies at the very root of it, and that lies at the very root of what Imam Sain meant when he said that I am going to reform the Deen of my uh, grandfather. Dr. Andrabi started to read more about the tragedy in Karbala many decades ago, and he believes. That some Sunni scholars have failed to criticize Muawiyah for paving the way of his son Yazid's selfish upbringing. He believes more Muslims need to look at the martyrdom of Imam Hussein with an open mind to see what really happened in Karbala and the significance of the event. That is why Dr. Andrabi commemorates Ashura along with his family and friends, so that they do not forget the massive injustice that happened. Nearly 14 centuries ago. What do you think makes Imam Hussein's story relevant in today's world? His relevance is actually for the whole humankind. 
the relevance lies in the fact uh, that uh, it's uh, it's the belief in something you believe in in a principle and there is a saying uh, uh, it's a saying i think it's a saying by a non muslim but it's a good saying it's a saying that if uh, if something is not for which you cannot die then it's not for which you should live so imam sen made islam a principle for which one should live and one should die that means if you hold something dear and you have there's nothing personal in it there is no, nothing selfish about it it's all about the uh, it's all about good intentions then uh, you must you must not sit idle and you must uh, you must take this step you must you must make the you must take the initiative what imam sen did now everyone may not take the initiative of uh, a karbala type initiative uh, everyone may not be qualified to do that it was imam was uh, placed at a very high uh, intellectual and spiritual uh, pedestal everyone does not match that but the lesson for the whole uh, humanity is that when you see things going wrong and you you believe in something and your your belief shapes your life then you should not you should not sit and watch you should take the initiative because if something is what you are living for uh, it is something what you should be ready to die for it's not necessarily you should die but you should be ready to die for do you think a lot of sunnis know about the story of Imam Hussein in Karbala or do you think there's a cover up about what really happened there yeah that is an interesting question uh if you uh, if you uh, talk to uh, the sunni muslims and if you watch some television channels uh where sunni muslims and the ulama their ulama they uh, talk about karbala uh you will see that they are they are very much uh they they really mourn for what what has happened and they will talk very high of imam sen and zainab and uh, all, all these people uh but uh, as you said there is definitely a cover up the and let's let's see what the cover up is uh the cover up is that they they uh they direct all their guns at yazid which is uh, which is uh, which is uh, which is which is a fact i mean to the extent that yazid at that time it was yazid and yazid ordered what happened at karbala now but my uh, my point is that uh, you can't direct all your guns at yazid without understanding the background of yazid you it's it's absolutely unscientific to uh, to look at something without looking at its context if you see in uh, in the physical world when we conduct scientific experiments or in the social or historical world when we study events we always take into consideration the background that has uh, uh, that was there before something happened nothing happens all of sudden this is this is the rule in this uh, creation of god and we must we must understand that everything in this world uh, works according to the sunnah of allah Allah has prescribed laws in this world for things to happen. Nothing happens all of a sudden. Now, where the cover up is that people in the same breath they keep praising Mawia as well as uh, uh saying good words about Hussein and it does not make sense. If you praise Mawia uh, and as well as Imam Hussein and then only uh only you say bad things about yazid and you you uh, you hold him only responsible 
that's not the true understanding of what happened because the true understanding is that a rot had set in a rot had set in it was only a matter of time that Yezi did what he did it was only a matter of time so unfortunate things had started happening and it was the culmination and it it was to happen it was a matter of time because when when you see a, a vehicle when you see a vehicle it has taken it has uh, it has uh, it has taken a wrong direction it should have not gone left but it has started moving left then it's only a matter of time when it hits the uh, what, what what you had thought it should never hit but it will hit once it has uh, set itself on on that direction so the cover applies precisely there and it's the duty of all uh, um, enlightened all sincere people to educate people about this because as i told you in the beginning imam Hussain lies at the very consciousness of islam i i can hardly imagine a muslim who who may not uh, who may not be feeling too much when it comes to imam Hussain and who may not be loving imam Hussain and what what happened and who may not be loving prophet's family but what needs to be what needs to be explained to them is their their love for Imam Hussain uh, does not carry it, it does not have meaning it does not have uh, you know it should have meaning and it should be it should be uh, it should be authentic uh, for for having meaning they have to understand the whole thing they they have to understand how it happened who did it and they have to get a proper uh, understanding of what preceded uh, what preceded Karbala and there is where cover-up takes place by vested interests they do not want it to happen but those people who are independent and do not have any vested interest and are sincere for Islam and for people and want people to think properly they, they should note this point uh, please talk to us about Imam Hussein's personality um, and his spiritual significance. If you see Imam Hussain, he was he, he was the closest person to Prophet himself, uh, um, as we come across uh, the so many events that he used to go on the back of a Prophet when he was uh, praying, when he was in the Sajda. So he was very much he has close intimacy with. Prophet, and we also know that the Prophet, uh, he 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 predict he said this thing is going to happen, uh, and um, at Karbala, and he knew this thing is going to happen uh, for Imam Sam. So uh, he he knew fully well that God has kept a very high station for. Uh, Imam Sain, uh, and he he will one day he will uh, come across he will face this, and then when you come down further, uh, you will see that uh, Imam Sain's father, Hazrat Ali Alayhisalat Wasalam, who uh, Prophet said that he is the uh, he is the Babul Ilm, and Prophet is the Madintul Ilm. Prophet is the city of the knowledge and the every city has a gate and the gate is uh, Ali ibn Abi Talib and he, uh, he, he grew in the supervision of Imam Ali and the, he grew in the unique uh, unique affectionate lap of Hazrat Fatima Zahra and that was something which is the spiritual significance of which is too much which uh, I am I'm too weak a person to talk about that what what it means to be nurtured by by a lady like uh, Hadrat Zahra and it, it would have not been without that that Imam Hussain could do in Karbala what he did it's an extraordinary uh, uh, it's uh, you can't you can't sort of uh, you know you can uh, uh, you can do so many things you can you can order them for example 
there are great speakers there are there are uh, there are very uh, there are speakers who who are paid uh, thousands hundreds of thousands of dollars for speaking for one hour because they are very good in public speech but public speech is something that you send someone to a college of public speech there are colleges of public speech who who train you how to speak how to use words so you can order so many things but what imam sahan did it can't be you can't you can't make it an order you can't order it it is something very divine and that would have not happened had it not been for the fact that he was nurtured in the lap of hazrat zahra alayhi salatu wasalam and that was that was something very great which made him uh, which made him unique what would you like to tell the world about your own experiences of imam hussein what happened at karbala it's not simply an event that took place so many centuries back and they are looking back at an event and uh, some are mourning some are not mourning some are going into procession some are not going into procession and they are simply commemorating it commemoration is not uh, is not the ultimate thing commemoration is a natural thing people uh, what happened there people will keep uh, people will keep mourning and people will keep saying what happened they will their their eyes will uh, be filled with tears and they will weep they will cry and this this is quite natural this will happen but but this is not where it should end the uh, what happened at karbala has a future dimension and they must understand the future dimension of it the future dimension of it is to stand up before tyranny it is to stand up it is to resist any anything which is forced on you you have independence god has created you independent for the worship of god you have to preserve you have to uphold your independence they uh the uh, what happened at karbala was basically about the baya imam husain would not give his allegiance to someone who he thought is not is not qualified for that Welcome to the World in Imam Hussein show. In this episode, we will be interviewing Chris Hewer, who is a Christian teacher. We want to find out what he thinks and knows of the story and legacy of Imam Hussein, peace be upon him. Chris spent most of his life in religious and theological studies. He studied Christianity and Islam, and now spends most of his time helping Christians and Muslims understand each other's beliefs and to foster better relations. between the two faith groups I've been doing this kind of work for nearly 30 years we used to have a specialist center in Birmingham which was called the center for the study of Islam and Christian Muslim relations and there we would have Christians and Muslims from all over the world coming together to study these two faith traditions with professors from both religions students from both religions and also organization administration from both communities and then after that i worked in the city of birmingham as the interfaith advisor trying to find ways to develop a better understanding within a city of many different faiths and many different cultures and then for 5 years i worked in london where I was the St Ethelburga fellow in Christian Muslim relations and my brief there was adult popular education when did you first hear about imam hussein and the tragedy of karbala i spent a number of years 
uh, studying about Islam with different Muslim professors, and that gave me a, a background, a basis on which to understand more. And part of that understanding was to work in a Shia academy. And I used to teach a few basic courses there for them. And during that process, the students there taught me about the importance of Imam Hussein and the importance of the story of Karbala in their life. And therefore, I began to start reading and exploring this more and thinking of ways in which I could explain it to others. You see, at any time of the year when we hear of something happening in Iraq, it is very likely that it will be tied up with one of the shrines of one of the Imams. Often it will be something that happens when crowds of people are gathering for a pilgrimage. Now, people who are just listening to the news need to understand something about this background. And when they hear the story of Karbala, they need to hear it in a way that explains not only the event, but also the spiritual meaning and the impact that that has on people down through the centuries. When you were reading about Imam Hussein and the tragedy, um, what had the biggest impact on you? What struck you the most? I think that the, the greatest impact of the story is his willingness to embrace the struggle against injustice and tyranny, not 